You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. And I, I, I will always love you. Yes, I will always love you. At what point does one of us take the other person and throw them over their shoulder? <laughs> and run in slow-mo. <laughs> run in slow-mo, yeah. <laughs> What's up, everybody? You are watching slash listening to the Command Zone podcast. I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. So, Jimmy. <laughs> yeah. It's been a little over six years. Oh, we passed the mark? Yeah, in July. Wow. Uh, it was six years that we've been doing this show. Okay. So, that's six years of Commander here at the Command Zone. Um... And in that six years... A lot has changed. Yeah. So there's a bunch of effects and cards that we used to refer to all the time. Yeah. And we don't really talk about a lot of them that much anymore. And we've, we sort of find ourselves cutting those things from our deck more and more often. Yeah, we were pretty hyperbolic about them too. Like, this is the best, the greatest, you right. ha- must play staple. Uh, and a lot of that has changed, as has the format, and has has the world and the meta around Commander. So that's what we're going to be talking about today uh, on our 355th episode is that the cards and the effects and the things that we used to think were great, but now may not make the cut so much. Yeah, cards that aren't good enough anymore. Yes, but, but that we... doesn't mean they're bad. Right. They're just not as good as they were before. Because uh, you still might want them. <laughs> before we get into everything, we got to talk about our sponsors, cardkingdom.com slash command zone. You know, Zendikar Rising, it's out now. Commander Legends, so on soon. the horizons. Oh. If you're like both of us, you're probably not quite caught up on the amount of stuff that you need to get your hands on from this year because it's just been one thing after the other. Uh, like I still don't have well. a lot of Jumpstart cards. I'm waiting for the reprint on that. Yep. Zendikar Rising, I've only got a little bit. I need to probably get a little bit more more uh, modal double face cards. I'm going to order all that stuff at cardkingdom.com slash command zone because when I order it there, I'm not only ordering from the best place with the fastest service that's going to get you the cards in the best condition, I'm also simultaneously supporting the content that I enjoy. What a two for one. Yeah, it's value. <laughs> that's magic value right there. <laughs> yeah, cardkingdom.com slash command zone. They are our number one place to go. And when we want to protect those cards and we want to play them on game nights, and if you too want to feel like you're on an episode of game nights or extra turns, you're going to protect them. You're going to play on Ultra Pro product. The sleeves are great. The new hyper Ecl- these. New Hyper Eclipse, not Hyper Gloss. Pro Gloss. New Hyper Pro Gloss Eclipse. There's a lot of names out there. I don't even know how we keep track of them. But Ultra Pro has been our go-to for quite a while. The shuffle feel is undoubtedly the best. And I am someone that's a. I like to call myself a pro shuffler. I've shuffled a lot of cards. Pro Gloss shuffler. Pro Gloss shuffler. And I will say that I love the Eclipse sleeves, and they really are durable, and they keep your cards nice and protected, and now shinier than ever. Yeah, that's the most important part. They protect your cards. They're not going to yes. get banged up, beat up if they're in uh, Ultra Pro Eclipse sleeves. So, or their top. You really don't want your cards getting messed up. So. They're amazing deck boxes. Some of the best in the biz as well as the best deals. So if you're supporting Ultra Pro, you're also supporting the show. And the final way to support all of our content is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone. You can chat with Jimmy and I on our Discord server each yeah. and every day. You can see things like extra turns. An extra day early. Uh, which is too late for the latest extra turns because it just came out, but the next one you get to see early. So patreon.com slash command zone. In fact, there's one other perk, and it's that we call out one lucky patron every single episode, and this episode is dedicated to Joe Joe Greenwood. Greenwood. Joe, you rock. You do rock. That was an easy one to say for (laughs) once. Yeah, I know. I was going to say, what's your favorite color, Joe? Thanks, Joe. Joe. Um, And of course, the final, final perk of being a part of our Patreon is that you get to audition for game nights, and those auditions are open right now until November 1st. That means that deadline is fast approaching if you look at the calendar. Yeah, so for patrons who are meaning to audition and haven't submitted your audition yet... Please get those in. Yeah. You don't want to be late. And then anybody else who is just finding out about it or has been putting it off, if you join our Patreon for as little as $1 per month, you don't have to join for one of the higher tiers or anything like Mm -hmm. that, then you're eligible to audition for the show. Uh, We do want to get as many auditions as possible just because we want to get the best possible person on the show. So again, patreon.com slash command zone. All right. And as we've said before, it's okay to sign up for the Patreon just to audition for the show. Totally totally fine. fine. Yep. All right, okay. let's get into the main co- topic. Cards that aren't good enough anymore. <laughs> they don't make the cut. Yeah. So, you know, we've talked about it 
a lot recently on the show just about how the commander format has changed mm-hmm. over the years. Um, the average mana curve of our decks has gotten lower. Games feel like they've gotten a little bit faster. We've done statistics as well to show that really spells above a certain CMC don't even get cast that often in games. Yep. So we're going to go over this first part, which are what are the major things contributing to the change of the format? And then we're going to talk about the specific cards we think that are sort of most affected by this. Yep. So we've got five points here of how the format has changed over the years. First one is one that keeps changing, but fortunately, I think we're at the end of that change cycle. But it's the. I mean, somebody could invent a new one, you know, tomorrow, (laughs) and then who knows? I really like the current one. Uh, But it's the Mulligan rule. It has changed twice now since we started playing the format. When we originally started, it was the Partial Paris, which was a way to Mulligan where you draw seven cards and you go, you know what? I only want three of these in my hand. I'm going to put the other four away, draw four, and replace my hand, and then you shuffle the rest of your cards in your deck. Yep. Uh, It was a way that, unfortunately, meant that you could be very greedy with how you built your deck because you kind of had a mulligan for free except it was a selective mulligan when you started the games and that fortunately is no longer a part of the format but what that allowed you to do is of course build decks with higher cmc cards less lands because you knew that you could mulligan to a hand pretty effectively that had everything you needed yeah if you draw too many lands you ditch a few of them get draw some more if you draw not enough lands you ditch some of the non-lands but you can keep the good cards like yeah you know those hands you draw where you've got a soul ring a land but it's really not playable besides that well i'll just keep the soul ring the land and maybe one of the card draw four more probably draws me into a playable hand so it was a little bit broken let's be honest uh then we switched to what was called the vancouver mulligan so this was anytime you took a mulligan so you went down to fewer than seven cards Mm -hmm. you would then scry one uh after you decided to keep so you'd say okay six cards then i scry one and then that will give you a little bit of your card advantage that you lost back by drawing less cards. Yeah, but the thing is, if you went down to five cards, you would also only scry one. It's not like you scry yeah. two. And this uh, was a big change because this is when Commander was now in line with what the regular sort of competitive magic system was, uh, just to keep it all unified. Yeah, and let's be clear here. In all of these situations, Partial Paris included, you were still allowed one free full mulligan because it's multiplayer. So even under the, the uh, Vancouver mulligan, you'd look at your opening seven, didn't like it, draw a new seven. If you didn't like that, then you'd go down to six plus the scry, then five plus the scry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Yeah, that was, it was fine. It it, it caused a shift in deck building, though. We noticed at that time, like, people started needing to put more lands in their deck. Yep. Um, You couldn't be as greedy. Like you said, probably couldn't have as many high CMC cards just because they would get stuck in your hand. You couldn't partial pair them away. Yep, and now we have finally switched to the London Mulligan, which is, I think, the best of all of them. Whereas every single time you mulligan, you don't draw less than seven cards. You'll always draw up to that full seven. But if you're mulliganing down to six, you would draw that seven and then choose one card in your hand you didn't want there and put that on the bottom of your library. If you mulligan to five, you still draw seven cards and then put two cards on the bottom. So this gave you a full look at the hand and allowed you to be much more selective about what you kept. Yeah. Um, and I think this in general, I've seen pro players on you know Arena playing it on stream. Everyone seems to be very happy with this version of it. Yeah, this is, I think, I agree, the best mulligan so far in the format in in that it, it punishes you a little for mulliganing and being greedy looking for certain cards, but at the same time, if you draw bad hands a couple of times, it doesn't mean that you don't have a chance in the game. Yeah. I mean, going down to five, obviously, is bad, but you will have a mulligan four times for that to happen, so it doesn't doesn't come up very often. I think same rules kind of apply as for the Vancouver Mulligan, though. You you can't be as greedy as you could have under Partial yeah. Paris with the amount of lands in your deck and the amount of high CMC cards and things like that. Yep, and so that was a big thing that sort of shifted the commander meta. It seems small, but at its core actually makes a big difference in the long run. Yeah, I think it's probably four or five lands on average. Back in Partial Paris, I think you were fine with 33-ish lands, Yep. and now we're 37 probably. So that's four cards in your deck yeah. that uh, you had to find, you had to get rid of and put lands in place of them probably and i think also the general commander knowledge is that yes you have to hit a land drop every single turn if you don't if you miss like your fifth land drop you are in serious trouble so that changed things a little bit just sort of having a collective awareness of that as well uh the second thing that changed in the format over the years is that there are way more two mana ramp options available than there used to be uh, and they're more accessible to non-green colors yeah So thanks to cards like Arcane Signet. Which is the third most played card according to EDH Rec. Smothering Tithe. That's the ninth most played card. It's not two mana ramp, but it's just very good. And it's in white, so a mono white deck now has ramp. Dockside Extortionist. Two mana. Thought Vessel. Two mana. And then they completed the cycle of the Talismans. Yes. Uh, And a few other things came up in there, but ramp 
became more accessible at lower casting costs. And you find that all these two mana ramp options are just played pretty much ubiquitously across all the non-green colors and color pairs and things. Yeah, and there are a lot more commanders available as well, which means there are going to be more commanders at 4 CMC, 5 CMC, and 2 mana ramp is just always good. Now people have signets as well as the talismans, as well as arcane signets. So, and then you have, you know, your regular just 2 mana rocks. Belwar so, stone, Belwar stone. Thought vessel, So right there, that's stone. every every deck has at least access to 6, Prismatic usually lens. around 6 or so uh, mana rocks. Yeah, so you can get good. to seven, I think, in almost any... Uh, yeah, two-put color pair, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, next right. point. I'll let you do it. Yes, this is the one that I think uh, Josh brought to my attention, even though I'm the kind of person that would, you would think, naturally come to this conclusion. But games are just faster now, and I think this is just an ongoing trend because as the format develops, as cards get developed, the power level slowly gets pushed. Yeah, more, low, more powerful lower CMC yeah. cards. Yeah. Like, it can't go the other way, right? Like, if a powerful five drop comes out, it doesn't speed up the format. But every time a powerful two drop comes out and it pushes out a three drop, then the format just got a little bit faster, right? Yep. So it's just always going to trend that way. Yeah, and we've also seen the power creep on commanders as well. So games just go more quickly because now, you know, decks are able to combo out a little faster or establish a board position that's impossible to beat a little more quickly. So there have also been a ton of red cards that have been printed that just increase damage. And that has become a viable strategy for red that sort of opened up in the past year, I'd say so, which is Watsi's looking at red and probably going, you know what? If they can't win the game by drawing cards or ramping out, they can win the game by just doing more damage and the, uh, you know, what we always refer to as player removal. Uh, and also I'd say when we started the Command Zone podcast six years ago, one of the reasons we started the show is because we looked around for a show about Commander because we started playing Commander and yeah. we couldn't find one. And in the intervening six years, there's tons of Commander content now. And the format has become, you know, even Wizards admits the most popular way to play Magic that there is, Paper Magic specifically. Yep. And so with the preponderance of content created directly for the Commander format, including EDH Rec, which again didn't exist when we first started the show, I think just decks in general, people out there are just building more efficient decks than they did um you know six years ago obviously at least more knowledge as well has to do it you know mm -hmm. a lot of episodes of podcasts ours included eh rex included talk about how to be more efficient to do more damage to play games faster yada yada yep all right uh the next bullet point is higher cmc cards are less viable and this is partially largely in part to uh, due to the last point which is games being faster faster the game is the worse a seven drop looks because there just are some games where you might not even be able to cast it yep um in most games i would say you you get to seven mana still in commander but it doesn't have time to play out that seven drop hits the table and then the game's going to end within a round or two so that seven drop doesn't have time to accrue the amount of advantage if it were a 12 or 14 turn game where like it's sitting there for six turns really get churning and getting you a lot of value yeah and of course when these hand cards are left in your hand as well and you're waiting to turn five or six to play them the chances of someone doing the josh thing or the jesper thing which is unload my hand and then cast a windfall or wheel of fortune is going to happen a lot more often so that just kind of wipes out the whole like ah i've got a game ender i'm going to wait and hold on to it until it's the right time to cast it there's a lot more wheel decks according to a poll that you actually did on twitter recently yeah there are a lot more wheel decks so when i did the poll on twitter i did it at the same time as the lands matter uh decks right. that we were talking about but it was somewhere in the realm of like 45 percent of people had a wheel deck wow um i think it was closer to 40 but a large percentage of people so four out of ten and and that makes sense right because we've had a lot of wheel quote unquote commanders come out it used to really be just nekusar mm -hmm. like that was the wheel deck fevered visions yeah everyone's favorite <laughs> and <laughs> now we've, we, since then we've had the locust god arjun riel the everwise braylon and shabraz Zyrus. it goes on and on there's been a ton of commanders printed that really just want you to wheel a lot yeah and all of those are again like the decks are pretty fun as well they play well and they're very efficient as well and like playing a real the everwise deck you're just going to Ooh, be so i mean yeah. yeah so the value is there and obviously it's a it's a legitimate strategy and who doesn't like drawing seven cards yeah the people who already have a nine drop in hand they've been waiting to drop on the table yeah yeah they're not happy uh and the final point that we're going to talk about here as far as how the format has changed over the years is new strategies emerge old strategies mm -hmm. get outclassed this is just something that's going to happen as new cards are designed um not to mean that everybody has to play the best strategy but in general the ones near the bottom of the heap get to tend to get played less just because they're not as viable and yep. as fun as it is to play a deck that you know is not um, as powerful as other strategies 
it's the type of thing where after a while you do want to win some games and you tend not to play the the lower power decks as much. You you want a couple in your arsenal for fun, but in general you you don't want your entire deck arsenal to be, you know, fours on the power, power scale in general. Yeah, and this is us also generally, you know, I think like Voltron decks have even though we kind of bag on them, they've slowly fallen by the wayside just because the strategies aren't as good. And as lower CMCs happen, more creatures out to block early. Yeah, so a remember, lot of things sort of um, change with that meta shift too. Yeah, remember what's the, oh man, what's the exalted double strikey one? Rafik. Oh, Rafik. Rafik oh, used many, to be... One of my favorite commanders at first. Yeah, early on when we started the show, Rafik was a powerhouse deck that you would be scared of at the table. And now you would never really see a Rafik deck uh, because, I mean, not never, but you rarely see it because it just can't sit at the table anymore with the sevens and eights. It's really hard for, you know, those Voltron strategies to kind of take games. They can knock out a player. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, and of course, old cards as well have sort of been upgraded and there are better versions of older cards, sometimes at lower CMCs or just the same CMC that does more stuff. Mm -hmm. So a lot of stuff just in time gets outclassed, like we said. So Purify versus Cleansing Nova. Uh, and you wrote Beacon of, Beacon of Tomorrows versus Nexus of Fate. Like you can just look at those two cards. Beacon of Tomorrows is eight mana, Nexus of Fate is seven. So you immediately have just a better version of that card on the text and the CMC. So there's no reason to not play the better version if you have access to it. So as a result, CMC is drop games get faster yada it's basically everything we just said <laughs> yeah and i think you know the strategies that have emerged because of new cards that have come out you know like um the boros strategy we talked about was it the last episode or the episode before two, two episodes, episodes ago. ago yeah yeah which is play all the fetch lands that you can play and then play brought back savines or reclamation second sunrise mm -hmm. crucible of worlds Think of that package. It's, it is really predicated on a lot of new cards in there. Brought back, Savine's Reclamation. Uh, even the fetch land part, you want Prismatic Vista, you want Fabled Passage. Yep, yep. So that package doesn't really work until you hit a critical mass of things that kind of all work together. And I think in the old days, with just the fetch lands and Crucible Worlds, not as good. But now you add Brought Back, Savine's Reclamation, you add just enough, and now it becomes viable. And that might push out some other strategies that Boros was doing before, just because... Yes, it's expensive money-wise, but if you have those cards, it does become, I think, a little bit better than some of the other things maybe Boros was doing before. Yeah, most importantly, it lets Boros keep up finally in a way that wasn't able to, and then by saying, okay, new strategies are available, this one's actually more aggressive in nature, then you're changing how the format works. Um, and then also, like, some strategies just won't work anymore if someone has Teferi's Protection. Like yeah, that's true. You just true. cannot win with like a token it's too swarm dangerous. stretcher. It's too dangerous. Yeah. Um, and, you know, before it was just like, haha, I've got a Rakdos charm. Hope I can use it against you when you swing out with all your tokens or whatever. But cards like that, Veil of Summer, have just sort of changed the way that you sometimes have to play those final turns. So I had a note here. I just, I don't know where it fits exactly. But remember when. Oh, yeah. There <laughs> was a point in time where. Deadeye Navigator was a card that everyone was calling to have banned. That the, protects itself. A lot of people flicker, were. Yeah. yeah. And you never hear Deadeye Nav Navigator uh, named in those conversations about cards that need to be banned anymore. And I think that shows you how the format has evolved and how it's moved because Deadeye's just, it's the same card it always was. And mm -hmm. in some respects, it's probably better than it was because more creatures like Agent of Treachery have come out since then. And Deadeye's still very good, but it's not a ban-worthy card. People don't complain about it like they used to. And I think yep. this kind of shows the shift in the format, just the fact that a card that has not changed is just not as powerful as it was because the format as a whole kind of caught up to it. Yeah, and it also takes nine mana to play and activate the Navigator Eight, once. I think. Yeah, so like at that point, it's like, you know, there are a lot of powerful spells that have printed since then, like Expropriate, that just completely are saying, you know what, if you cast this spell, it's almost a guaranteed win, whereas Deadeye, you have to jump through some hoops. It's Yeah, yeah. it's good, but it's not as broken it's as not amazing. Yeah, some yeah. other things. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. Now that we have a better idea of the current meta for Commander, what are some cards that we used to love or at least play that don't quite make the cut anymore? Um, I wanted to note... Big caveat here. <laughs> yeah, we aren't saying that you should never play these cards that we're about to talk about. Because we still do in certain decks. Yeah, with specific synergies, I think many of these cards are still good enough to make the cut. But in the average deck, Jimmy and I just find that we're playing them less and less. So we aren't telling people like what to play or what not to play. Play what you want. I know there was a big hullabaloo in the community, I don't know, a couple months ago about like content creators coming out and saying this card's unplayable or don't play this card. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, First of all, if you're watching content online or consuming content online, like most of it is about recommendations for what cards to play and not yeah. to play, right? A deck tech is essentially 
telling you what cards to play, to play. <laughs> and by elimination process of elimination telling you what cards not to play. It's all opinion, so you can either listen to us or not listen to us. But if we ever say like, oh, that card's unplayable, try not to get mad about it. That's just our opinion. You're free to play the cards that you like and the cards that you think are good. No one's telling you you have to play this card or even saying you're dumb if you don't. We're just saying like, I think this card's better. That's kind of our jobs, right? Yeah, and also, of course, this is all dependent on your play group, depending on what you all want to do to have fun. Some play groups are like, you know, we don't care. We're all playing 10 drops all the time and that's just fun. No one ever counters anything. That's fine too. So this is what we are, again, basing off of our own meta, but we also sort of see these trends happening a little bit more around the world and from stories we hear on Discord and all that stuff as playing well. Playing on Spell Table, you're playing with more people yep. from diverse uh, play groups than you ever have before and i think you're going to settle um pretty close to what the the power level that we usually talk about is yeah. it's either cedh and then you know that's its own category and then i think most people are playing similar to eights. what we play on game nights which is sevens and eights yeah yeah and also one last thing is that i don't think there's any player out there who's going to say no i want longer games and we've talked about this before Some, listen i've heard from players like that but <laughs> i think it's a lower percentage yeah, yeah yeah i think in general everyone wants games to go a little faster and so that's why the trends that we talked about even if you're not actively, you know, working to achieve those trends or be a part of it, it's happening kind of naturally as, you know, we have less time to play. And during a something a, a situation like this, we want to get as many games in as possible instead of just one or two massive ones that take the entire night. All right. Caveat, caveat over. Let's talk about the cards that are no longer good enough anymore. All right. Let's start with ramp. We yes. alluded to this again on a recent episode of the show, but... Because of the two CMC ramp that's become available in the last few years, I find that I'm playing almost zero three mana rocks. In fact, I'd say most of my decks have no mana rocks, no mana producer producing artifacts that sit at three mana. Yeah, artifacts specifically. We're still playing cultivates and that stuff like your that. Heart. Yeah. Like let's imagine a three mana mana rock that said, you know, tap at a mana of at a colorless mana. Yeah. But and, draw a card when it enters the battlefield. Or even draw a land, right? Yeah. Go your, about, yeah I, so. I mean I would hundred percent play that card. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately a lot of these don't do that. So Dark Steel Ingot was considered a staple for quite a while. It was printed all the way back in the original Commander Precon. So three mana artifact has it indestructible and you can just tap it to add one of any color but again this is just not cutting it same with commander sphere um which even has a really you know it says draw a card in it but you have to sack it to draw that card and then chromatic lantern which is a card i used to play in almost every single deck with three colors or more even my five color decks do not run chromatic lantern anymore wow that's a that's a that's a statement. Chromatic Lantern uh, makes is a three mana rock that taps for a mana of any color, but it makes it so that all of your lands tap to add a mana of any color. So it fixes you. I think it's just more of a convenience factor than anything else these yeah. days. It's not better than a signet. Most of the time, you just want your mana earlier rather because you just asking how much raw mana does that card add to my board, and the fact that this costs three and adds one, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that costs two and adds one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's also Coalition Relic, which, you know, I think used to be one of my favorite mana rocks because you can get up to two mana from it after you play it by putting charge counters on it. Uh, if you're like in proliferate decks, there are ways to get the counters up even more and more. And so this one, I still play a little bit. So I mm -hmm. think I lied when I said I run no three mana rocks in any of my decks. I did just cut it from a deck the other day though. Which deck was it? It was, I can't talk about it because oh, okay. it's for future it's content, a secret deck. but it was in the list. And as I was going through and I, you know, for game nights often, we'll make the list 108, 109 cards uh, and gather up all the cards and then mm. goldfish a few times. And then you're figuring out those last seven or eight yeah. slots and Coalition Relic. I was like, nope, it's too slow. It has to go. It is a little too slow, especially when, so in Limited, this is great because you can tap it to add a charge counter. And then at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, you remove all the charge counters off it and add a color of any of whatever you want. So what you do is on your opponent's turn, you tap it when you're not using it. And then your turn, you can use that mana and tap it for two mana. However, when you're waiting three full turns to get back to you for that extra one mana I, you'd honestly just rather play a two cmc rock and have two things to do on turn three instead of just one yep um the other one the next one is kind of big mana rocks rocks that tap for a lot of mana all at once so gilded lotus five mana for an artifact taps and adds three uh, mana of any one color yep three and dynamo four mana that taps three colorless to your mana pool and then there's also like cage sun which doubles the mana from a specific color um, and it and makes, pumps your creatures as well. Yeah, so you choose a color when it enters, and then it pumps creatures of that color, and then 
all the lands that tap for that color yeah. tap for one extra, right? But these cards cost five mana, four mana, and six mana. And, you know, I've run a lot of mono red decks and before Cage Sum was sort of one of those requirements. But every single time you draw a six mana card that is going to ramp you on turn five or six, it just doesn't feel good. Even though the mana return is huge when you're able to untap with it, someone getting rid of this, you just not being able to untap or only using it for another two turns because that's the rest of the game just doesn't feel that good. Yeah, you're rarely able to play it and then also have, you know, three or four mana over here that are now going to tap for double, so it kind of is cheap. Yeah. Like, that just doesn't happen as much as it used to, right? Yeah. In the old days, when you get to turn 11 or 12, you're like, boom, play Cage Sun, and I actually gain a little bit of mana because I have enough untapped lands still left over, but when the games are shorter, that situation doesn't come up as much. Yep. Uh, the next one is similar, Mana Reflection. This is four green, green for an enchantment. Uh, if you tap a permanent for mana, it produces twice as much of that mana instead. This can still be very powerful under the right circumstances, but... Yeah, especially if your mono green can ramp this out and have a bunch of, like, a soul ring with tap for four now. Yeah. But I still find that it's similar to Cage Sun, where it's like, if... In any game where I'm able to play a six mana spell that just doesn't do anything, yeah, you know, and in the best case scenario is I kind of break even on mana, uh, I almost always would rather that that was just an impactful card that's like affecting my opponent's board or pushing my board position or position in the game forward, you know, immediately. Yeah, and mana reflection too just doubles your mana. It doesn't do what Zendikar Research does, which is draws you a card yeah. and rewards you for playing spells and doubles your mana. And that just costs one mana more. So reflection, I think, is a very much more of a niche card than it is sort of just an auto include if you can play it early. Uh, and then the next one is kind of a trio of cards. Yeah, showing and how what happens, by the way, over time with these types of cards. So it's explosive vegetation, explosive veggies, which is <laughs> three and a green for a sorcery. Search your library for up to two basic land cards, put them onto the battlefield, tapped, and then shuffle your library. There's also circuitous route and there's migration path. Um, Sky Shroud Claim, but I wouldn't put Sky Shroud Claim in the same category because those lands come into play untapped, so and I still like that forests card. forests as well. Yeah. yeah. Sky Shroud Claim often only effectively costs you two, and the turn where you Sky Shroud Claim, leave two mana open, use that on removal. Yeah. Those are good turns, so... But these other ones, they come into play tapped. Yes, it's four mana for two lands into play, but I just find that, like, well... I'd rather have the two mana ramp and even the cultivates and Kodama's reaches are still good. Yeah. And so by the time I get up to here, I've already ramped once or twice and I don't really need this. I'd rather, again, just play my commander or have another an impactful card that, you know, improves my board position or presents a threat or something. And Explosive Edges was the first of this sort of cycle or type of card. And the Migration Path came along, allowed you to cycle the card away, so it was slightly better. Circuitous Roots finds gates, in case you care about that. Both of those are strictly better than Explosive yeah. Vegetation, But right? still not good enough, I think, anymore, just because, again, four mana ramp is just looks way worse than one and uh, two and three. I still would run a Migration's Path maybe once in a while, and I still have Explosive Vegetation in a couple of decks, but... The more, option to cycle on Migration Path is very important. Yeah, more and more, though, I'm, I'm just, like, looking at those cards being, like, if they, pr pr if they print, like, one more three or two CMC ramp spell, that's getting pushed out probably that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right, let's talk about card draw here. And this is really interesting to me because as we went through and said, you know, what's happened to card draw in the format? Not a lot's changed in six years except for one specific color. Yeah, they just seem to get better and better, it seems. <laughs> so there's certain ramp in green that has been pushed out, sorry, not ramp, certain card draw in green that has been, used to be played a lot and has sort of been pushed out as the years have gone by. So, Not by better artifacts, by better green cards, by yeah. the way. So Life Crafter's Beastery, which is an artifact, and every time uh, a, you cast a creature spell, you can pay green, and if you do draw a card, that just doesn't tend to be worth it anymore. For a while, it's awesome play, but why pay extra mana? Why cost the mana when you can just, when you have, just have a card that draws you a card when the creature enters the battlefield? Yeah. Yeah. There's tons of cards in green now that just draw your card if a creature enters the battlefield. I don't need to pay any extra mana. So yep. why would I play Life Crashers, Be sure. And those cards are generally cheaper than a card like Soul of the Harvest, which is four green, green for a trample, six, six. Whenever another non token creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may draw a card. But that's six mana for a removable creature. Yep. Not so great. Regal Force is another card that used to see quite a bit of play it's four green 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 and when it enters the battlefield you draw a card for each green creature you control very narrow often you'll be in a situation where they board wipes and you're like crap i'm gonna draw one card off this thing yeah not so great uh harmonize a card that still does see a lot of play but it's just two green green for a sorcery draw three cards so four mana three cards it's it tends to get cut for me quite often in favor of some cards we're going to list in a second yep. just because there's so much good green card draw i don't need a sorcery that draws me three cards i can 
play a card that's going to draw me nine cards over the course of the game. Yeah, instead of three right now. Yeah. And there's Colossal Majesty, which is an enchantment at the beginning of your upkeep. If you control a creature with power four or greater, draw a card. So it's like, oh, cool, rewards you for having big green creatures. Yeah, this one is just narrow. And it's, again, it's similar to Life Crafters Beast Tree in that it just has another um, hurdle you have to jump through, right? You have to have a big creature. At the beginning of your upkeep. And it only can draw you one card. Why would I do that when I can just play a bunch of cards we're about to list that just draw you cards every time you play a creature spell? So the cards we just talked about, those are the cards that got pushed out, we think. We don't play them anymore. In favor of, because green... Just got a ton of awesome card draw in the last few years. So let, Guardian Project. Every it, green deck. Every green deck. It's built for Commander. Every time you cast a creature with a different... Basically, if a non-token creature enters the battlefield and it doesn't have the same name as another creature you control, you draw a card. So every creature you're going to play isn't going to have the same name because we're a singleton format. So yeah. this is just cast a creature, get a... get a Or sorry, creature ETBs, get a card. Yeah. This next one is insane. This also just goes in pretty much every green deck it can. It's the, the Great Henge. Yep. Seven green green for a legendary artifact, but costs X less to cast where X is the greatest power among creatures you control. You can tap to add green green and, and gain two life. And it says, whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, put a 1-1 one, one counter on it and draw a card. And you can often put this out for three or four mana. Yeah, because green, again, has and big creatures. And immediately tap it for two mana. Yep. One of our favorite new instants is Return of the Wild Speaker, which is a four green for an instant. And the, the more important mode is you can draw cards equal to the greatest power among non-human creatures you control, or you can give all your non-human creatures plus three, plus three until the end of turn. Often just draws you five cards at instant speed, yeah. six cards. And then Colossal Majesty looks a lot worse compared to Garrick's Uprising, which just has way more text, gives your creatures trample, uh, draws you a card if you control a creature four or greater when it enters the battlefield instead of waiting for your upkeep. And then every time you play a creature with power four or greater, you draw a card. So there's just a lot more upside to cards like this. And those old ones are just, they just look, they just kind of pale in comparison. Yeah, it's funny to me that we looked at card draw and really most card draw kind of stayed the same. It didn't change a lot for most of the colors, except green who vastly improved their card draw. We used to be playing Harmonize and Soul of the Harvest and Regal Force, and we don't play those cards anymore. We play Guardian Project. Amazing card. Great Henge. Amazing card. card. Return of the Wild Speaker. Really Amazing good card. Amazing card, yeah. <laughs> and to me, you know, we, we complain a lot about white um, in the format and the fact that it's, it's lower powered than the rest. And I actually think this has been maybe the biggest consistent design mistake that maybe they're not even aware of of the last like four or five years in comparison to our format because giving green card draw makes it so that why don't you, why wouldn't you just always play green because they already have ramp ramp and the one th downside to ramping a lot is that if you ramp too much you can over ramp and just not have actual cards to play you're like i can make 27 mana but i have nothing to do with that mm -hmm. mana because every card i drew just made more mana but then they decided green should have a lot of card draw which totally mitigates you know their other strength so i think you know and i don't even think it's an argument anymore green is the best color in commander by a, a wide margin and it's because of all this card draw they gave them over the last like five and six years. Yeah, I think in general too, and you've seen this with a lot of the bannings in standard as well, is that green and blue have just been given an incredible leg up above the rest of the competition. And it's not even like a fair fight where the other colors can be like, well, uh, it's okay because I got this. It's like, no, you got that, which is just vastly better than what we have. You guys got Chulane, you guys got Kinnon, you guys got Uro. What did a red get that even comes close to matching that power level? So I do agree that I think giving green just such a boost of everything that it needs to be the most viable color. In fact, mono green decks, I think, are also easily the best mono color decks in the format just because they have access to both the most important parts of, of card draw and ram. Yeah, putting card draw and ramp together is just a combination that makes for powerful commander decks. And the fact that one color is like arguably the best at both of them, I just think is a very large mistake. And the problem here is it's really hard to go backwards because these cards are going to exist. And it doesn't matter what you do moving forward. Guardian yeah. Project's not going to go away. Great yeah. Hinge isn't going to go away. Even if you say tomorrow, I'm going to stop making good card draw for green, It green's already got good card draw so what are you going to do um and and yet white can't get good ramp or card draw they're like well if we gave white card draw you just only play white and no other color if that's, like, true, that's then what's true. going on with green yeah. yeah 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 okay enough complaining about that i think uh we've got a whole bunch more cards to talk about as far as cards that we are we don't think are good enough yep. uh, for our decks anymore but before we get into that we're going to take a quick break and hear a message from our sponsors Oof, it's not easy being a super popular planeswalker 
I can't even go outside without thousands of screaming fans mobbing me. I mean, you can't blame them, though. I am gorgeous. That's why I started the official Soren Markov fan club. And let me say, opening my own small business would have been much harder if I didn't have Stamps.com. The fan club requires a lot of mailing, and you've seen how hard it is for me to get around. Imagine me trying to dodge the paparazzi and get to the post office. Impossible. But Stamps.com makes it easy. I have all the mailing and shipping services I need right on my computer in the comfort of my own gothic castle. I can print postage on demand, and they even offer UPS services with discounts up to 62% and no residential surcharges. Whether you're a small business sending out autographed photos, an online seller shipping out locks of your immortal hair, or just mailing out extravagant gifts to those who have pledged you their eternal servitude, well, Stamps.com can handle it all with ease. And right now, our listeners get a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage, and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in COMMAND. That's Stamps.com, enter COMMAND. Okay, I better get back to signing these photos. The sun will be up soon, and well, I need my beauty sleep if you know what I mean. Shh! Come closer. Being a spy for House Demir here on Ravnica is no easy job. I've got to be very patient and observe everything I can. Which basically means standing around a lot and trying not to get bored. Thankfully, every Demir agent is provided with some really cool equipment to do our job. In fact, they just gave me the newest model of Raycon wireless earbuds, the Everyday E25 earbuds. And they're the best ones yet with six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and a more compact design that gives you a nice noise isolating fit. That means I can listen to my favorite podcasts, like the Command Zone, while I do surveillance for my guild. And Raycon started about half the price of any other premium brand on the market, which is good because the spine stuff doesn't pay well. The company was co-founded by Ray J, and celebrities like Snoop Dogg and Melissa Etheridge are obsessed with Raycon. And yeah, we have the same celebrities here on Ravnica. That's not weird, right? Anyway, for a limited time, get 15% off your order at buyraycon.com slash command. That's buyraycon.com slash command for a special 15% discount on Raycon wireless earbuds. Make sure to check it out now while the deal's running. Buyraycon.com slash command. You there, what's your business here? Uh, waiting for the Ravnican public transit. Bus. Blue light, sir. Blue, huh? Figures. Okay then, carry on. Porous Legion. What a joke. Getting through the day can be tough. Finding that energy to complete that project or the initiative to go and work out can be exhausting without the proper preparation. And not just that, but having the energy at the end of a long workday to get in that gaming session, that's important too. This show is brought to you by G Fuel, the official energy drink of eSports. It's a healthy alternative to other energy and caffeinated drinks on the market. Using G Fuel is as simple as mixing your favorite flavor with water and you're good to go. Zero sugar, 25 calories total. Their formula has over 40 different delicious flavors and, like Josh said, it's a healthy alternative to the other energy and caffeinated drinks out there. And if you're a little overwhelmed by all the flavor choices like I was, don't worry, they've got all sorts of starter kits that come with everything you need to get going. You'll receive a great selection of flavors to try out and this cool shaker cup. So get energized and stay hydrated. Head on over to gfuel.com and use the code COMMANDZONE, all one word, to get 30% off your order if you order within the next few days. Yeah, that's 30% off. It's a huge discount, but it's a limited time offer. Go to gfuel.com, use the code COMMANDZONE. Again, one word. Take advantage of this great deal before it's too late. Okay, we are back talking about the cards that just ain't good enough anymore. They don't make the cut. They're... Cute without an E cut from the team. They used to, they used to, some of them in some cases be like all stars on the team, at yeah. least in the rotation, but now they're on the practice squad. Maybe sitting on the bench a little more. <laughs> yeah. Getting towards retirement. Yeah. But, you know, they had a good run because they've been replaced by other cards. But we're going to keep talking about the cards that we don't think make the cut anymore. And now we are moving on to removal, which is a fun category because these days, you know, we used to say five sources of targeted removal. That number has continually grown and climbed now to where it's almost at the same as 
ramp, ramp card, card draw. draw. Yeah, I'd say eight, eight nine, to ten. ten single target removal is more uh, more often than not what my decks want now. Yeah, it's very important just to be able to get rid of problems when they appear. I think there's just more really big, if we don't kill that now, the game will spiral out of control um, threats. And so yep. you just need removal more often. Whereas it used to be there was fewer things that like, hey, if that last one rotation, we just lose. But there's more now, so you got to run more removal. And one interesting thing, one interesting thing about removal is that a lot of it has been upgraded over the last few years in that a bunch of these that we're going to talk about, we used to run it, and now we're just running kind of better versions of them. It's not like yeah. that removal spell got bad. It's that a better version came out. Like, it's, yeah. not, it's not like you don't want that effect. It's just like, well, why would I pay four for that effect? I can find the similar thing for three. Yeah, and I'd rather pay three and three life rather than pay four. And sometimes that one mana does make all the difference in Commander. Speaking of which, let's start with Utter End and Vindicate here. Uh, Utter End was a staple type staple card. And it was, yeah, it came out in cons right when Josh and I started playing again. We were like, th put this in every single black white deck you can. It is the perfect removal spell for Commander. At four mana and instant. It's two white black for an instant exile target non-land permanent. Wow, Very flexible. so good. Yeah. Uh, but it's that four CMC that really makes it so that I just don't play it barely any more uh vindicate is a sorcery yep. version and uh it says one white black for a sorcery destroy target permanent can even hit lands uh which is why a lot of people are like vindicate's just better it, it can hit lands uh, sorcery though yeah it's sorcery now if you compare utter into anguish unmaking which is one white black for the same thing but you pay three life instead I think in Commander, when you have 40 life, it much often seems like the better option. I just think of like Phyrexian mana. Those are all awesome because you pay the life for the mana, right? That's, yeah. Anguish and Making is kind of similar, right? Right, 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 right. Instead of uh, two life, it's what? It's three, three life, life instead of one mana, but that's still better than the yeah. other end, which is you always pay full price for. Yeah, and Vindicate too, like, you know, we often advocate to play your strip mines and those types of cards in your deck, so you don't necessarily care so much about destroying the permanent of a land so non-land permanent versus permanent doesn't make a huge difference in commander these days i don't think and instant just matters so much because listen vindicate ain't gonna catch the cabal coffers they play and activate on their turn right, right. Get they, cradle. yeah they and that's 90 priority yeah yeah 90 percent of the time that's what they're doing and sorcery speed it's gonna wait till your turn till you destroy their cabal coffers that they already use to get a huge advantage so it doesn't tend to work out in your favor even if you do destroy a land with it yeah and now we have cards like despark as well which is white and a black for an instant and then exiles target permanent with confirmed mana cost four or greater for two mana at instant speed now, you're going to miss things 3 CMC and less, and if, especially if cards are getting less CMC, but this is still really darn good, and most, it's instant speed. Most of the cards that you're, like, going to lose to on the spot are 4 CMC or more, so D-Spark is just, again, yeah. it's and we, hard to hold open 4 mana on your turn, right? It will yeah. it will really affect the amount of things you can play on your turn and how you can advance your board, st board state, whereas holding open 2 mana is doable. Yeah, and a lot of the cards we talked about, D-Spark gets rid of, like, Guardian Project, Great Henge, Smothering yeah. Tithe, all of that stuff, so... Um, okay, let's go back to, because I skipped over one, because oh, right. you mentioned Anguish I'm making, so I was like, oh, we have to talk about it now. Yeah, this is a card that I remember seeing a lot when I first started playing, and staple. I thought, this was a staple, this goes in every single deck, and that's Return to Dust, it's two white white for an instant, you can exile target artifact or enchantment, however, if you cast a spell during your main phase, you may exile up to one other target artifact or enchantment, so it's a four mana, exile two artifacts or two enchantments or an artifact or enchantment on your main phase, or just one outside of that. Four mana exiling one thing at instant speed on someone else's turn, not nah. yeah, far. <laughs> I hate that. And then four mana on your turn doing it to do things a little bit better, but it's on your turn and you're tapping out to do it. You're creating aggression. It's just this card doesn't have the same veneer and shine that it used to, uh, which is a bit unfortunate. You want it to have instant speed. That is just how the format is played now. Just like Vindicate, Guardian Project's going to hit the battlefield and you want to get rid of it right now before yep. they get any value off of it or maybe on their very first card they play they get one card but return to dust it's so hard to hold open the four mana so you almost always want to cast it during your turn which makes it a sorcery speed spell which makes it way worse and i just cut it from every deck now i i don't think i have to return to dust in a single deck anymore yeah especially because we're not playing mono white really so yeah. you're gonna have another color and gonna have a nature's claim which costs way less can do basically the same thing and in general i'm not too worried about people getting enchantments back to their hand it usually is creatures that are the big one out of the graveyard and return to dust exile stuff which is like oh maybe that's the upside there but again i just don't think it really fully sort of gets over the downsides of it. I mean, there's like Grasp of Fate, 
you know, that's three mana. It's an enchantment, so you can get rid of it, yeah. yeah. But at the same time, gets rid of one thing from every opponent. Like, yeah. that's just so much better, I think, than Return to Dust. And if you just want to get rid of an enchantment or artifact, it's usually one. Like Jesper said, right? You're usually not losing the game to two cards at any one time. It's one card that's going to beat you, and if you can get rid of it, you'll live. Yeah. In which case, there's just way more efficient ways to get rid of that card. Um, in a similar vein, Mortify which is one, a white, and a black for an instant that says destroy target creature or enchantment. There's also putrefy, which is one, a black, and a green for an instant that says destroy target artifact or creature, can't be regenerated. And then there's also maelstrom pulse, which is one, a black, and a green for a sorcery, destroy target non-land permanents and all other permanents that share a name. Uh, yeah, and all yeah. other permanents so that like, share a name is that permanent. If yeah. they have a bunch of tokens or whatever, yeah. but again, sorcery speed. It's non-land permanent, sorry. And I think. oftentimes someone will make a thousand tokens and have a goblin bombard them out. So what does your maelstrom pulse do? And but, a sorcery speed. But kill you when you cast it on them. There's that dream where you destroy two soul rings or something, but most of the time it's sorcery speed removal and you would just rather have the yeah. cheaper, more efficient... Assassin's Trophy, black yeah. and a green. You can destroy target permanent and opponent controls. And then, of course, they the controller can search your library for a basic land to put it on the battlefield and shuffle their library. But that is nothing compared to the fact that it's just black and a green for any permanent, including lands. Yeah, to be, care, to be fair, we're, I mean, to be clear, we're not saying we're cutting Assassin's Trophy from our deck. We're saying Assassin's Trophy is the reason that yes, exactly, Putrefies, sorry. Mortifies, and Maelstrom Pulses are getting pushed out because they keep they print cards like Assassin's Trophy and you're like, well, let's just play that and get rid of Maelstrom Pulse from my deck or whatever. Yeah, um, and I can count on my hand how many times maelstrom pulse has gotten rid of like five things at once or a bunch or of two tokens. even like it just rarely happens it, you usually yeah. like, kill that planeswalker Woo. yeah it almost never happens uh another card we're cutting from a lot of our decks is decimate it's the card they just may never play again it honestly used to, we used to play it a lot right yeah any red green deck right it's like yep. oh my gosh you can get rid of an artifact creature enchantment and land however you have to have illegal targets for all four to be able to cast decimate so if someone doesn't have an enchantment out then you can't cast this and that sucks and if someone that does have an enchantment now, but you don't want to blow it up, you have to cast this and you still have to target it. So there's a lot of downside to a card like this. And of course, sorcery speed. Yeah, and so often you really just want to destroy one thing badly. And yeah. then you're just saying like, well, while I'm doing that, I'll get rid of this, this, and this. But I don't care that much about the other three targets. Well, if that's the case, just play a spell that costs one or two mana. Yeah, and, and save only the other two mana thing. for something else in your hand to cast or hold open. Yeah. Uh, and finally, this was a really good one you put on the list because yeah. I used to play the hell out of this card and I think I have it in a single deck now. I used to play a lot of yeah. this type of card, right? Because it just seems so cool. It's Desertion. Three blue blue for an instant counter target spell. If an artifact or creature spell is countered this way, put that card onto the battlefield under your control instead of into its owner's graveyard. It's just like, wow, the value is insane. We're going to blow them out with this. And, and when you do cast this spell, it is the worst for the person you cast it on. Yeah, yeah. It steals their card and, you know, they don't get to have it but it's five mana it's very hard to hold hold open and in general i just find that there's other things i'd rather be doing than hoping someone casts an artifact or creature because yeah, a lot of times you're like uh it's a wrath i'm gonna counter that but for five mana it just feels horrible yeah and also if you have all that mana open someone's gonna look at their hand and be like i'm not gonna cast the cool creature i want so maybe they dump out two small dumb creatures and you just sit there looking at your thing going Maybe I should have countered something else earlier in the turn instead yeah. of thinking about stealing it. Because when I read this card, it just says, you better steal something with it. Otherwise, it's not worth it. Well, the worst ever is if it comes back to your turn and you didn't cast it and you're just like, okay, untap and you just wasted five mana you didn't spend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so basically, what we're saying is we've been cutting everything that is in the removal category that's not instant speed and three CMC or less, mostly less than three MC, CMC. I want my removal to be at two CMC or less uh, and I want it to be instant. Yeah, and we've been spoiled, too, by Swords and Path to Exile. Those are the greatest removal spells at one mana. You know, even Tragic Slip, you're like, hey, yeah, I'd rather play that than a four-mana thing, get rid of something. And D-Spark, Assassin's Trophy, they've given us some new toys that yeah. have pushed out some of that higher CMC stuff. All right, let's go to the next category, which is Board Wipes. Woo. What Board Wipes are Jimmy and I not playing anymore, are not making the cut anymore, are not good enough anymore? I keep forgetting the name of the episode. This is a card that I still will auto-put into any white deck. Uh, and then oftentimes I go through my deck and they'll look at it and go, I don't know if it makes the cut anymore. Yeah, it's like the 70th card now. Yeah, it's Austere Command, four white, white, and it's a sorcery, but you get to choose two to destroy all artifacts, all enchantments, all creatures with CMC three or less, or all creatures with CMC four or greater. So at its 
most basic, it can just be Wrath of God because you blow up all creatures CMC 3 or less than 4 or greater, which is everything on the battlefield. Yeah, I mean, this card is good because you can often, like, keep part of your board or you, I have more artifacts than everybody. I'll just blow up enchantments and big creatures. Or mm -hmm. I have all big creatures. I'll just blow up, blow up the small ones and enchantments. Um, that versatility is good, and I, I do still play this card in a few decks, but I, I'm like you. I find myself cutting it more and more just because that 6 CMC it's a lot. is so much. And the times when you draw it in your head... You know, is uh, it's just the worst because you're like, okay, well, a, a card that advances my board might bring me closer to the win. Yeah, this is actually going to do nothing because I don't want to do any of these modes because I'm winning. Yeah, and I'm so far ahead that I can't even find the right combination. Um, and also, there are just a lot of board wipes out there, like Time Wipe, right, where you get to save something yeah. and you still get to wipe every, uh, everything else. And so there's a lot of times when I think I've had austere command and I just go, you know, I'm just not casting it this turn. Yeah, I just have to do something else because otherwise it hurts me too much and doesn't hurt them enough. So even though it seems like a catch-all, it can still be really conditional based on the board state. Uh, the next one is Terminus. Four white, white for a sorcery. Put all creatures on the bottom of their owner's libraries. Which is often better than killing them because you don't want a lot of... Incursion, like, graveyard, yeah. Yeah, against a lot of opponents, you don't want to put it in the graveyard. But it has Miracle for just a white, so you may cast this card for its Miracle cost uh, when you draw it if it's the first card you draw this turn. So this can be just one white for a board wipe. The problem with that, with Miracle, in most decks is that you board wipes are the type of thing that you want to time very specifically. You're not yeah. often just like on a random turn drawing it and going, oh, well, I'll just miracle it right now. Yeah. You set up for it, you know you have it, you go tutor for it when you really need it, that kind of stuff. And six mana just is too much for this effect. Um, so I thought it was funny because Austere Command and specifically Terminus, we did a like best board wipes in the format episode <laughs> like years ago. <laughs> what did I, we say? I believe we thought Terminus was the best board wipe in the format Whoops. and Austere Command was like top three. And it's funny that we find ourselves not playing either of these cards much anymore. Yeah, I just want to have faster interaction, right? I, instead of being like, and for me too, it's like board wipe, let's add another 30 minutes to the game. I'd rather be like, path that one problematic thing that's going to win the game for you on the spot and we'll find a way to deal with everything else. Or my deck doesn't actually care about the fact that you have a bunch of creatures on the board. I'm trying to do my own thing. So the board wipes and the way I've been building, it just seems to be going away from that, like, let's hit the reset button because yeah. that's the healthiest thing for the table. Yeah. Um, all right, more board wipes we've been cutting from our deck. These two are pretty similar, these next two. Yeah, it's Decree of Pain and Overwhelming Forces. These are just massive black spells for six black black each to destroy creatures. And then you draw a card for each creature destroyed this way. And uh, Decree of Pain has the also additional ability to cycle it and then give creatures minus two, minus two, two until on the turn that costs five mana to do so. Have you ever cycled a Decree of Pain? Absolutely not. Yeah, I think I've done it one time. I think ever. I've only cast Decree of Pain like twice. It seems sweet when you do it because you destroy all the creatures and then draw like eight cards. But it's eight mana and it's just so many games you just hold it. Yeah. You just never cast it. If you're in like a mono black every single mana doubler in the color then yes, this is more doable. Or even a green black ramp, ramp, ramp so you have eight mana. The most important thing, right, is play this, draw the cards, and then be able to rebuild. Yeah, because what happens is you're like, kill everything, draw eight cards, go. Then they're like, fine, play this, play this. Then your next opponent plays three things. Yeah. Then your next opponent plays three things. Comes back to your turn and you're staring down like seven or eight more permanents. You're the last one to repopulate your board. And you had to discard a bunch because you just drew eight cards. Yeah. <laughs> so not, not <laughs> you great You didn't even there. get them all. Not great there. Uh, the next few are these artifact-based uh, board wipes. So there's Navinural's Disc, there's Oblivion Stone, and there's Perilous Vault. All of them have different mana costs, but basically they're an artifact that comes into play and then you pay additional mana and you sacrifice the artifact and you board wipe. Um, they all cost a bunch of mana, except in a Vineral's Disc, which comes into play tapped. Yep, but it only costs one. Yeah. The problem with these cards is that the moment you play it, it's almost like a giant magnet on you and people can play around it really well. I wonder if it's because our play group years ago learned the strategy against these cards, which is, hey, if somebody plays Navinural's Disc, everyone attacks that person until, until they blow it up. It. Yeah. And so we just, in our play group, they came, they became way worse. Where I think if you're in sort of a newer play group or less experienced and seasoned, player, seasoned players, you might be able to play Navinural's Disc and then hold it over everyone's head and get some equity out of it that way by like, I could blow this up, don't attack me or whatever. Whereas in our group, we're like, 
I'm not going to allow you to hold that over our heads. We're just going to keep hitting you until you crack it. Yeah, and we're also going to keep our resources. We're not going to play stuff out onto the board. We know that whatever's out here is done. And also, you know, sometimes if someone, if you play the disc, it's tapped, everyone has a turn, they can bounce remove something it. back to their hand, yeah. remove it. There are a lot of ways to get around that sort of card. And Oblivion Stone takes eight mana to activate, and Perilous Vault takes nine mana to cast it and use it the same turn. So again, just not efficient enough, and it really kind of messes up things when people know how to play around it. All right, uh, this is one that you added that I was like, yes. yeah, you know what? You're right about that. I used to play this all the time because I was like, you know what? This is awesome. I have a bunch of artifacts in my deck. I'm going to play all is dust to set, make everyone sacrifice all colored permanents they control. Turns out people seven play mana. more and more artifacts these days, so that doesn't even work out well for you. And seven mana for a board wipe that may only get rid of like four or five things on the board, not so great. Yeah, there's so many staple type artifacts that very often you play all is dust and... You know, you lose the same amount of stuff as everybody. And you are tapped out and everyone has their artifacts. Yeah. You know, so it's it's just not as efficient. Even in a deck like an artifact-based deck, it it doesn't seem that great. Yeah, I think you need a lot of colorless creatures specifically, and then you can play that card. But yeah. in, it's just not like a catch-all board wipe like it used to be. Yeah, like it used to be. <sighs> the old days. The good old days. The good old oh, days. the good old days. Okay. The partial Paris days. <laughs> uh, the next section is tapped lands. So... We used to say things, and we haven't said this in a few years, uh, <laughs> like, yeah, if your deck has a few guild gates, it's fine. If it has a few lifelands, it's fine. Refuge You kind lands. of, like, say that, I think, generally, because it's, like, it's true. You know, there are a lot of lands that come into play tapped. The modal DFCs that we're talking about come into play tapped. So, you're not, it's not the end of the world to have to play a couple of them. Having said that, I because back in those days, it wasn't, we weren't putting anybody on, right? I did have guild gates in a few of my decks and things, and it was fine. I have zero guild gates in any decks anymore i don't have any refuge or lifelands i don't think in any deck anymore yeah. um even the tri lands i have fewer of those than i used to have in my deck anymore because they come into play tapped and there's Stun just so many more options now for the two color lands since then yeah and i think we we aren't wrong that you still can have some lands in your deck that are forced to come into play tapped but it's fewer than it used to be i feel like it used to be somewhere along the lines where if half your lands came into play tapped it was mostly not a great big deal and, and wouldn't feel like it lost you the game and it just as as it gets faster, as the format speeds up, you have to be more efficient. It feels like stumbling of any kind can punish you more than it used to. So, like, I need that fourth land. I have to play a tap land. And instead of playing my four drop, which is maybe my commander, I have to play a three drop. Or maybe I don't even have a three drop, and now I'm yeah. playing a two drop. And that just can lose you the game, it feels like, anymore. I mean, imagine, too, on turn two, you only have a land and an unt uh, another tap land, or two tap lands in your hand. Yeah. You can't play your two-mana rock anymore. And then it's just like you just basically time-walked yourself. Yeah, so uh, I put hideaway lands on here as well, mm -hmm. which I think are still playable, but you don't want multiple hideaway lands. It just feels like games don't last long enough for the hideaway to really yeah. have an effect or happen very often anymore. Not that it never happens, just the hit rate is low. Yeah, you're better off playing like a Halimar Depths, which allows you to scry when it comes into the battlefield basically for three. So that's better at the very least. Yeah, um, and like you said, so we have, we've had the cycle lands come out. We've yeah. had the battle bond lands. We know that cycle's being finished in Commander Legends. We've had the have lands from Battle for Zendikar. The modal dual, uh, face. Dual, double face These cards. Yep. The ones that are lands on both sides, they come into play untapped. And we've been able to replace guild gates and refuge lands and even tri lands now with these lands that come into play untapped most of the time. Or, or are all fetchable. The time. Yeah. Right? So that's nice too. So I think that's why these have slow the the old guild gates and stuff have just slowly gotten pushed out and we just don't run them very much anymore. Yeah. I think if you're again just building a deck and just trying to make it work color wise, you're still fine playing them. But just know that in a lot of games, if you have too many tap lands, you're basically adding an extra turn behind everyone else because you're going to always be one mana down because they're coming into play tapped. I mean, I think in a lot of cases, just run more basics is better than a lot of guild gates and stuff. You Back can to basics. Yeah, you can still have a couple, but don't have you know you definitely don't want three, four, five guild gates. You used to be fine if you did that, but I don't think it's true anymore. Yep. All right, uh, let's talk about... Speaking of lands. Yeah, utility lands is another category here. Another and one of my old favorites, where yeah. when I first started playing the format, someone played one that was, goes, oh, you don't need only lands that tap for colors in your deck? Right. Wait, that one does what? Oh, I'm putting that on all of my decks. And they can be very powerful, and I don't think we... You know, it's not like don't run any utility lands, but there are certain ones that I just run less and less these days, and in general, I run less utility lands than I used to overall, right? Yeah. Used to be like, hey, 37 lands, uh, 12 of them could be a utility lands, and it's like, I don't want to do that as much anymore, because if you miss a color, 
that's stumbling and you that could lose you the game especially if you have like black in your deck and there's a card that costs two black 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 yeah. it's like oh gosh no cannot put that many utility lands in here uh rogue's passage was one of those cards i fell in love with i was like wow i can make creatures unblockable i have a rafik deck this is how i'm going to win the game and this card still gets played in like narset decks and all that stuff but it's not one of those auto includes like i used to think it was because to me this used to read like alternative win condition maybe you just need to get in that little extra bit of damage but paying four mana for it and doing it on your turn just feels so bad. It's like mystifying Maze instead of Maze of It. It just costs so much mana to do, and sometimes it's not even the right thing to do because you'd rather spend that somewhere else. It's five mana, really, because you have to tap the Rogue's Passage right. plus four mana to make something unblockable. Five mana? Five drops are incredibly powerful cards, so you would have to be killing them, I think, for that to be worth it, and that's just not the case. I find that whenever I have Rogue, Rogue's Passage in a deck, my rate of usage is like 1 in 50 games. Yeah, I almost never activate them, and yeah. as a result, they've come out of most of my decks. Yeah, if it's not going to be there, just put a Swamp in, just put a Mountain in, yeah. you know. The deck needs to very specifically need that effect, and generally, Badly. the Rogue's Passage is already a redundant version of that effect, and not your best option either. Uh, here's a card a lot of people in the community have been uh, calling it o uh, overrated for so long that I do think it's even still kind of underrated, but I do <laughs> I still have been cutting it from decks. It's Temple of the False God. It's a land that taps for two colorless, but you can only activate this ability if you control five or more lands. Yep, this would be great in any decks that play green because you're guaranteed to get more lands out, but if you're in red, white, any of those colors, even blue, I wouldn't really recommend playing this because you just can't... It almost feels like you're playing one less land in your deck and you will occasionally just draw a dead card. Yep. Yeah, it's just risky to play. I do think the games where it is your fifth land and you have that extra mana and you ultimately win those games uh, partially because you just have that extra ramp card that was free, yeah. it's hard to deconstruct that after it's happened and go reverse engineer and say, you know the reason I won that game is Temple of the False God that yeah. I turned to play. Turn. Whereas the times when you play when you have it and you don't have uh it's not gonna be your fifth land it's gonna be your fourth land or something that's very obvious to you as a moment when like this card screwed me because it does nothing right now yeah so i think there is a balance there and i think temple of false god's still playable probably more playable than most people think but to be fair i do cut it from a lot of decks i don't play it in every deck or anything also if you're it's, playing this as your fifth land on your fifth turn you're not going to get that much mana out of it but if you're in the, like a mono green deck or just a green ramp deck and you get this out turn three and you match the conditions yeah it's gonna do a lot more work all right. Um, oh, this one is fun. Again, a card very, we used to see quite a bit. Yeah. A very expensive activated cost. And Grim Backwoods, it's a land that taps for colorless, or you can play it to a black and a green to tap it to sack a creature and draw a card. Ugh, four mana to draw a card and you're sacrificing a creature. A lot of things need to go right for this to be really efficient in your deck. And the mana cost is definitely hurting you. It's just like sack a creature, draw a card. I don't even want to pay four mana for that under any circumstances. Like, yeah. It's just bad. I know people will say, oh, it's on a land, so it's gravy, but I'd rather just have a forest or a for swamp, I think, almost always. And there's some cards that will just say black mana, sa sacrifice a creature, draw two cards, three cards, or whatever. Yeah. Like, it, it, it costs way less. Isn't going to Think about it this way. If you're activating all of these lands are about to do one thing and it's not even that impressive, then you should probably reconsider it. Oh yeah, and it is five mana effectively just like Rogue's Passage because you have to tap yeah. the Grim backwards too. Yeah, that's crazy. Now uh, this is a card that's way too expensive even though I love it. I used to play this card all the time and I don't play it very much anymore. It's Westvale Abbey. It's a land that taps for colorless or you can pay five and tap it and pay one life to create a 1-1 one, one white and black cleric creature token or you can pay five and tap it and sacrifice five creatures to transform it, and it transforms into Ormondal Profane Prince, which is a black demon that's a 9-7 with flying lifelink, indestructible, and haste. So, five mana to tap it and sacrifice it. Yeah. With five creatures if you want to use the other side of it. Ooh. There eh. was a game on Game Nights, I think, where it was just like, pass turn to you, Josh, and you're like, I'll make a 1-1. One, one. And then, <laughs> re and if you think about that game, I like made a 1-1 one, because one, I was just drawing land after land. I was flooded in that game. And all this did was cost me life because I was like, make a 1-1, one, one, make a 1-1, one, one, make a 1-1, one, one, somebody board wiped. Okay. Yeah. Make a 1-1, one, one, make a 1-1, one, one, somebody board wiped. I never flipped it. It showed how bad it was because, yeah, it was so giving me something to do when I had nothing else to do. But that, what I was doing was so bad that it made no difference to the game. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, it must have felt really bad. Yeah. Like, you literally felt like you were not playing the game at that point because you were making insignificant creatures, losing life at the same time, yep. and using all your mana to do so. Honestly, if the, in that game, the Westvale Abbey had just been 
a swamp, I just would have been up five life in that game or whatever, six life, yeah, you know, whatever right. I paid into it. Yeah. Yeah. And like the sacrificing five creatures as well to do this is a bit Christmas land unless your deck is again built to do that. All right. Let's talk about the high CMC finishers. Yeah. The cards that cost a lot of mana, but typically tend to end the game when you cast them this first one is a card i believe i talked about on the first episode or one of the first episodes of the podcast you know how like expropriate uh torment of hill fire yeah those are kind of our go-to examples or references for like oh you could play a card like time stretch mm -hmm. and what we're really saying is you could play a card that wins the game yeah insurrection used to be the card that we said in that spot before expropriate existed for like a couple for at least the first 18 months or so of the show yeah we would always just say yeah and you just cast an insurrection and you win the game because it's five red 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 to untap all creatures and gain control of them until end of turn and they gain haste so it's a mass active treason across the entire board but it's eight mana it depends on your opponents having creatures and heaven forbid someone has a propaganda up or like an altar of some kind. Yeah, sack outlets are so common these days, especially with this many aristocrat sex running around. I think it's partially our fault because we would talk about this card so much and then we started talking about how like you be defeat this card because in our playgroup, we got played enough that we had to all run, you know, sack effects in our deck to be able to like, oh crap, they played Insurrection. Well, at the very least, I'll sack two of my creatures. They don't get anything good. Yeah. At least we know how good Altar of Dementia is now, now that Insurrection is out. I also think in most games, there's going to be one deck that doesn't have a lot of creatures, does, doesn't have good creatures. There could be two. I've played yeah. games where like three creatures are played the entire time, and yep. I'd much rather just get rid of them than try and steal them for a turn and hit someone with them. They're like, oh, that's cute. You got my Wayward Sword Tooth and my Oracle of Moldiah, so yeah. what? Or you got my Seaborn Muse. You can't even, it doesn't even trigger for you. Because right, it comes back to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, another high CMC finisher that I used to be really high uh, on was I used to play this a lot. Memorial. Sorry, say it again. I Chroma's Memorial. <laughs> you said it's so cool. Chroma's Memorial. Chroma's Memorial. Seven mana, legendary snake, artifact. Snake, yeah, it's, it's a snake. <laughs> <laughs> Creatures you control have flying, first strike, vigilance, trample, haste, and protection from black and from red. Wow. wow! It's seven mana for this artifact. Seven. Yeah. Seven. A lot also, again, you have to have a board state prior to playing this. You have to make sure no one's going to board wipe before then. And then you finally slap down this seven mana artifact. Seven! If one person just gets rid of it right then and there... Oh, my Lord. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> but so often, too, you get it out and you're like, uh, okay, I attack with my 2-2 two -two and my 3-3. Three -three. You know what I mean? You but don't... it's got flying first yeah. track and all these cool <laughs> things. And everyone's like, great. I, great, I take I, five. Cool, yeah. <laughs> Are you done? <laughs> yes, yeah. I'm done because it costs seven mana. Yeah, it costs way too much. This is definitely one of those magical Christmas Dreamland cards where it's like, you imagine you have a massive token army. You just played this thing out and you swung for a billion damage. Or you could just play Crater Behemoth. Yeah, it used to be one of those cards that you were like, oh, my deck needs haste. Yeah. So I would put this in there. But then you realize, like, seven mana to give haste is just not good. Yeah. It's just bad. If you were able to get this out in turn two or three, and every single combat you had were able to do this and gain, you know, the, the massive advantage from just hitting people so often, sure. But you're never doing that. You're never doing that, yeah. Yeah. All right, the next is a duo of cards that are kind of similar. It's Army of the Damned, which makes a million zombies. And then it's Rise of the Dark Realms, which... Pulls all of the creatures from all graveyards and puts them onto the battlefield under your control. Kind of like Insurrection-esque. Yeah, these are finisher-type cards because they just make your board instantly ginormous. They cost a bajillion million mana. But, hey, if you untap after you've cast that, you'll probably win because you have so much stuff. Yeah, and Army of Them also creates tapped tokens, too, yeah. so you have to untap with it. Rise of the Dark Realms, there has to be stuff in people's graveyards, so you can't cheat it out super early. The game has to have gone long enough. I think that's one of the reasons it's worse now. If games are shorter, less graveyards are getting full, in yep. which case, sometimes you could cast this and be like, okay, what I get? Oh, I got an Oracle of Moldiah. What do you have? Oh, you have a, a Solemn and a Burner Star. Oh, sweet. sweet, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've actually noticed that I used to love pulling stuff from other people's graveyards. I thought it was so powerful, but with more and more graveyard hate running around and more people just, again, games ending faster, stuff doesn't hit the graveyard as often, and so often I look in like, all right, Josh, what do you have in your graveyard ramp spell ramp spell artifact ramp. okay never okay, mind yeah nothing uh, never good mind. nothing good yeah <laughs> and and that's if one player out of the other three is not good in their la the graveyard and the other ones are just middling it's just not worth it and also never mind the fact that command the dread horde exists now yeah so it's four black black for a sorcery choose any number of target creatures and or planeswalker cards in graveyards command the dread, dread horde deals damage to you equal to the total converted mana cost of those cards put them onto the battlefield under your control so you can pay life rather than mana which we know is good because of anguish unmaking and a million other cards and this is going to allow you to just cherry pick two or three cards play it earlier and your deck doesn't want 
five Rise of the Dark Realms abilities because the time you do it once and that usually is good enough or it's yeah. not good enough, but you don't usually want to do it again. And Command the Dreadhorde can grab Planeswalkers oh, as yeah. well. So, and you don't need to be like, oh, I don't want to take nine life and grab that creature that just is a like a you know colossal Dreadmall or whatever. Yeah, I don't want that at all. Yeah, no thanks. Um, next up is Debtor is Nell, a card that we definitely talked about a lot, but I've never played it. And because I re- remember thinking even back then, like this is way too much mana. Hey, we, I used to see it once in a while. Yeah, so it's four and triple Orzhov so white black white black white black so white 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 black white black white white black white black black seven mana either way at the beginning of your upkeep put your creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control again triggers at the beginning of your upkeep you have to play it wait a whole turn cycle hope no one gets rid of it chances are you're not playing anything else that turn and then creatures need to be in graveyards too dude i think if this card said at the beginning of each upkeep put, put target, target creature, creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control i think it'd be playable then but i think that card would be costed seven yeah so this only triggers once. It's just bad. It is just bad. And it's seven mana. And again, Command the Dreadhorde exists, uh, and it just, yeah, it gets got, got outclassed. Here's one we used to see quite a bit, and I almost never see it anymore. It's Praetor's Council. Five green, 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 eight mana for a sorcery. I think it still comes in perma- Commander Precon yes. sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's return all cards from your graveyard, all cards from your graveyard, to your hand. Then you exile Praetor's Council. Council. Uh, you have no maximum hand size for the rest of the game. So it's eight mana, draw you, you know, whatever you've got in your graveyard. But you probably can't play anything that turn. Congrats, you have a huge hand. But if your deck isn't like Hogak trying to get cards in the graveyard, then how many cards are you going to potentially return with this? Right? Even if you're ramping, let's say you ramped out to this spell. That's the funny part. You play a Cultivate, Far Seek, whatever. You got eight mana on turn six. You cast Prayer's Council. You return two cards to your, like three cards from your yeah, graveyard. And they're all ramp cards. You yeah. already have mana. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, ah, shucks. Yeah, I never play this card anymore. Yeah, again, eight mana just costs too much. It's just, it, and when you get there too. Um, there, here's a 10 mana card that mm-hmm. sometimes does say win the game on it. But again, you're much better off in a deck that can cheat this into play. It's Omniscience, seven blue, blue, blue enchantment. And you can cast spells from your hand without paying their mana costs. By the time you can play a 10 mana spell normally, chances are you won't have that many cards in your hand. Chances are that playing this just gets everyone to look at you and kill you immediately. So you're best off playing this card only if you can cheat it out. And yep. very specific decks can do that and not the majority of them. Yeah, you can't just throw Omniscience into a deck. I think you used to kind of be able to just have it in there as your big top end. Yeah. Now, if it's not Joda or something that's going to cheat the mana cost, yeah. you can't Show do and it. tell. <laughs> and it's often not a win anymore because someone will have removal. Yeah. Because people play more removal. Yeah. Again, 10 mana enchantment. Someone pays one mana to get rid of it. You may as well just bow out. You might as well just bow out. Just, <laughs> just cash scoop, scoop it up. up and get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next category is too slow. So this is just stuff that's just plain too slow. It's not necessarily a finisher or a nine mana play. Um, there's two in this category, which is like cheating of mana costs. Mm-hmm. I was shocked when you put this on here and my brain immediately was like, I disagree. And then I was like, no, actually, I don't play this card anymore, really. And I used to play this all the time. Yeah, it's Quicksilver Amulet. Four mana for an artifact. You pay four and tap it, and you may put a creature card from your hand onto the battlefield. So cool. You can cheat mana cost. Yep. Eight mana. Yeah. Two turns. Eight <laughs> mana for the first card that you... Yeah, which is, by the way, you could have just played, you know... Again, four mana, sure, you can do it with four mana, but this costs a lot every single time to activate. You can only do it once a turn. It has to be in the Jota decks and things like that that are playing a ton of huge things. Yes. Because in our average deck, we're just not putting very many seven plus drops anymore. So Quicksilver Amulet is just not good because I don't usually have a way to take advantage of it. I'm like, okay, tap four and put out a five drop. Like, <laughs> why did I do that <laughs> for? Yeah. yeah, win the game. <laughs> yeah. I just uh, don't have a lot of seven and eight drop cards to even take advantage of this because my average deck doesn't want to be like, well, if I don't drop my Quicksilver Amulet, I just have to hold this card. Yeah. Again, you'll see this in your Jota decks, maybe your... Uh, um, Jaleva. Jaleva, your... Uh, no, that's Instance and Sorcery, so you wouldn't put Quicksilver. Sorry, so I was thinking of uh, 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 Kalia oh, decks, right? Yeah, yeah. Tons of big CMC spells there. Maybe a Dinosaur deck or something. But in general, again, yeah, it's just eight man to do it. Not that great. And same goes for a card like Planar Portal, which is six mana for an artifact, and you pay six to tap it to search your library for a card and put that card into your hand and shuffle your library. So it's, yeah, it's into a repeatable tutor, but it costs mana 12 for mana card. for the first card, yeah. I don't think that card was ever good. No, but I've seen, I played it. Quicksilver Amulet, though, was in a lot of decks before, and I don't yeah. barely see it anymore, yeah. And I think it's still well, just in the decks that, again, want to have it. Um, because the four drop slot, I think, is even more important now. The, it used to be sort of like between, you know, like, oh, five and six are important. Now three and four seems to be the really sweet spot for the more important spells. All right, let's talk about a couple of tutors that are too slow. It's funny, I just built a Akiri equipment deck yep. for game nights, and I did not put 
this card into the deck for this exact reason we're talking about. Oh, it's Stone Hero Giant. It's three white white for a giant warrior, four four with vigilance, and you can pay one in the white and tap it to search your library for an equipment and put it onto the battlefield, and then you attach it to a creature you control. So it's like, wow, that's a lot of value. You're gonna tap it for two, put it on the battlefield, and it auto equips. Sweet. Hmm. Listen, people are onto this card, so they're going to kill it, first of all. So you don't want to spend five mana for something that they're just going to be like, all right, let's kill it. Yeah. Also, like, you don't want to tap it for two mana. And put, like, yes, you will do it, but it sucks because you're like, sweet, my huge giant that I would rather put an equipment on and swing with, I'm going to use it to go search for the... And it's yeah. seven mana to get your... So The you idea, know, right, is like, I'll attack with Vigilance, then tap it in the put the equipment on before it hits. But it just opens you up for the thing that is the worst feel bad in equipment decks. Remove your creature in response to the equip. Yeah, because they see Stony or Giant. So the worst thing that can happen to you in the world is they go, okay, pass turn, and they've got three mana sitting there. And you're like, okay, so what do I do here? Yeah. Because <laughs> if I do attack and do the thing, and they're going to be like, what's the target to equip to? And you're like, this thing, and they're like, kill it. Yeah. Ugh. That's why, and again, you know, Stone Hero Giant is sort of the budget version of Stoneforge Mystic, but that's why Stoneforge is just better because it's a two mana card that immediately tutors it to your hand. You can play it on turn two. You can play it on late turns, and it, sure, if, even if you don't get to use it after, at least you still have the card. Yep. Stoneforge is just way, way better. Two CMC. Yeah. The, that, that tutor part is just where it's at, I think. Yep. And sometimes you don't want to play the equipment out immediately because you know that someone's waiting for you to try and cast it and equip it. It's when you, I think equipment decks are tough because you outline your play pattern so yep. far in advance to everyone else. Yeah, so they're just like, hold my artifact removal up, and it can't be that bad for me, right? Because worst case scenario, I just pick off the equipment off the creature yep uh this next tutor is rune scar demon five black black for a six six flyer when it enters the battlefield you demonic tutor you search your library for any card and put it into your hand this is another card that if it's not in Kalia, if it's not in shadowborn apostles yeah. something that's going to cheat the mana cost out i just think seven mana for a tutor is too much yeah and generally black is not blinking stuff yeah, and it's cool when you maybe. play it, and yeah. sure, you get the value, and you tutor the card, but again, if you're playing it for full mana cost, the only other time I could see it is if you're playing that big mana black deck, which is Crypt Gas, Cabal Coffers, Urborg, and sure, you can play this a little earlier. Or reanimating, so if you can yeah. dump it in your yard if you're playing a lot of dredge and things like that. But black has a lot of options for cheaper yeah. to tutor out cards at this point, and they're not the best tutors in the world, not all of them are demonic tutor, but it might just be better than pl waiting to play a seven mana card. Yeah, it's what's the the portal one, the Imperial Seal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we have even more tutors than we used to, yeah. and they reprinted Vampiric Tutor a couple of times in the intervening years, so it's easier to get your hands on. Like, yeah. yeah, and again, it's not even that it goes to the top of your library. It's just that it costs way less than seven mana. All right, uh, the next two cards that are too slow are Black Market. Man, remember this card was like $25, $30? Yep. They reprinted it, and it's never gone back up because it's not that good anymore. Yeah, it turns out that when you have to wait and have creatures die to have it work, so it's three Black Black for an enchantment, whenever a creature dies put a charge counter on black market and then at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase you add black for each charge counter on black market sounds so good sounds so good but for five mana and when it comes back to your turn might not even give you a single mana not so great and I think this is directly affected by games are shorter, so there's just less time for this to play out in your advantage. Like, yeah, two or three creatures die, you get some extra mana, but then the game's kind of over. You, if the yeah. game's going to last 15 turns, then you just have a lot more time that Black Market's going to accrue counters and get you incremental advantage. And also, I think players are building decks in the ways that if you play this card, no one's going to go like, oh, let me just swing freely and get rid of creatures on my board. They'll be yeah. like, all right, I'll just wait until someone gets rid of that, or I won't give you the value. I'll just do something else from my hand instead. Yep. Uh, here's a card that was a powerhouse at one point. It's Assemble the Legion, three red white for an enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, put a muster counter on Assemble the Legion and then create a 1 1 red and white soldier creature token with haste for each muster counter on Assemble the Legion. So you play it, next turn creates 1 1 1 with haste. The next turn it creates 2 1 1s with haste, then 3 1 1s with haste, and then game's over because uh, you play this for 5 mana and on <laughs> turn 9 or 10 the game will be over. So and Good job, your Boros deck made a bunch of 1 1s. It made a total of 5 of them. Mm, yeah, nothing. <laughs> or six, you know? Yeah, the games need to go very long for this to be super effective. It used to be on those cards where you're like, oh no, Assemble the Legion is out, everyone get ready because this is the beginning of the end. Yeah, but oh, Oh man, my, in five turns, we're going to not be able to handle this. Yeah, meanwhile, someone's like, I'm going to flicker this, bounce that, draw 16 cards, and you're like, okay. I make a 1-1! One, one. <laughs> Muster! <laughs> too slow. Sorry, yeah, too slow, Joe. All right, let's talk about just this last category here. We're almost done. Some cards, they just have been outclassed. They just aren't playable anymore because too many cards that do the same thing or a similar thing have come out in the intervening years. Yep. Uh, this has been outclassed for a while. We just thought we'd mention it. Mind's Eye. Yeah, I used to put this in every mono red deck. Five mana artifact. Whenever an opponent draws a card, you may pay one. If you do draw a card. 
So typically, the turn you play this, you don't draw a single card because it's five mana. I don't even play it in my Boros sucks. decks anymore. Yeah. Yeah, it's just too slow. Six mana for one card, seven mana for two, eight mana for three, nine mana for four. Like, there's no point along that that you're happy. Yeah. Maybe at 100 cards for 105 <laughs> 100, mana. 100, that's your whole yeah. deck. <laughs> that yeah. ratio is never in your favor. I think that, again, like, unless you are powering this out by turn two or three, and then you're able to use it every single turn, it's just not going to accrue you the kind of value that you want. And even when you do, it's like, uh, not that great. Yeah. Uh, the next one is a red card, Jimmy. Furnace of Wrath. Ra ra ra. One, One red, 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 red for an enchantment. <laughs> One wrath, wrath, wrath for an enchantment. Uh, if a source would deal damage to a permanent, it deals double that damage to that permanent or player instead. Fire Emancipation, Tor Brand, Dictate of the Twin Gods. There's too many versions of this spell, yeah. and this is kind of the least good of them because of the casting cost three reds tough it hits all players a lot of that stuff only affects your opponents uh obosh a lot of things have come out where i just think furnace of wrath just doesn't make the cut as often anymore yeah and i would say even though dictate of the twin gods costs one more mana it's one less red mana symbol and it has flash yep. so you can at least use it as a surprise factor in a lot of times so furnace of wrath just looks a little clunky compared to the rest uh, okay, and the last one, and it means nothing that it's last, it just happened to be last on the <laughs> list, is Loxodon Warhammer. Used to see this this bad boy a lot, but not anymore. It's three mana for an equipment. Equipped creature gets plus three, plus oh, and has Trample and Lifelink, and then its equip cost is three. Trample and Lifelink? Didn't even put it in my equipment deck. Oh. Maybe I should have, though, because I died to Flyers, and if I had some lifelink, I just might a little, have bit, a little longer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just six mana is just too much for this. Yeah, and it doesn't even give a, a defense or a toughness boost. Yeah, if it gave plus three, plus three, maybe, but three to equip is just a lot. Like, the Sword Ofs cost two to equip. Yeah. Like, and they do so much more. Yeah, why is this? I don't know. This I just never play this card anymore. This used to just be one of those cards that's just like, it's big, it makes your creature a big beater, and you'll swing the course of a game because you'll suddenly gain eight life or whatever. Yeah. But anymore, I think it's just too slow. And with more removal running around, you go to equip, they kill the thing, and you just feel awful. Yeah, and, and again, like, these are all the dream scenarios that, yes, someone has a removal spell for your card, but even if you do equip it, get a little swing, and, and then they remove it, you've still paid a lot of mana for not a significant effect, again, compared to, like, the swords. Even Sword of the Animist, right? Just, yep. like, cheaper, so better. gets you so many lands. You Unless you really need that trample on lifelink, not the way to go. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. To the listeners, what cards did you used to play a lot before, but you find you they just aren't good enough to make the cut in your decks anymore? We want to know uh, what cards we didn't talk about that you've kind of phased out of playing yourself. Yeah, and also if your play group actually is completely against this and it's like, no, we all still run omnis omniscience and you know it just works, then let us know how that meta looks for you all because I'm interested to see how other play groups are dealing with that as well. All right, if you want to get your hands on... None of the cards we talked today. <laughs> well, let's say <laughs> you kidding. want Guardian Project, The Great Henge, yeah. Return of the Wild Speaker, all these green uh, card draw cards that have pushed out the old green card draw cards. Yeah, or it, let's say you have the old cards and you want to trade them in somewhere. Good point. So that you can get new cards. Cardkingdom.com slash command zone. Yeah, they do have a very robust buy list and you can get uh, additional credit uh, if you use it for store credit. when you s And you can do it through the mail and everything through Card Kingdom. Mm -hmm. uh, they're always buying all kinds of cards and they're well known for having the best prices on their buy list of just about anybody. Yeah, it's a great way to recycle your cards. You can yeah. just get regular money for them or you can get in-store credit and just sort of refresh decks that way, which I think is always an awesome way to go. And it feels much better than just, you know, having to buy cards every single time. It's great, you know, if you turn in like standard cards that aren't good in yeah. commander and then turn those into cards that are good in commander uh i know i'm a person that likes to crack packs kind of for fun sometimes and so you end up with a lot of chaff that way and that's a good way to turn the chaff into commander staples and things like that arcane signets and things that you need so yep. cardkingdom.com slash command zone uh not only if you're buying cards but also if you're selling cards as well Yep, and if you're protecting those cards, even if you need to protect them and send them to somewhere else, Ultra Pro is the one that we trust as always. And it's no joke, we've been having Ultra Pro products in my life at least for 15 years. I have playmats going all the way back to when we first started the podcast that are still in pristine condition. Ultra Pro just gives you the most vibrant colors and they have the best prints. They always are up to date with what is happening in the set. So that means all the new legends from Commander Legends will probably have, a lot of them will have awesome uh, playmats associated with them, as well as the sleeve and we've been using them for a long, long time now. I've just converted every single one of my decks to Ultra Pro Eclipse sleeves and the glossy ones, whew, can't beat them. The glossy ones are sweet. Um, all right, let's talk about the end step here where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. 
Jimmy, there's a series that I've watched, but you just started. Just started. You just finished the last yep. second season yesterday, you said, right? Yep, I finished it last night. Yep, it is The Boys on Amazon. And this might be the best series that Amazon has, maybe outside of like Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Yeah, Maisel, uh, oh no, the Fleabag's really, oh, really Fleabag, good. Oh, Fleabag, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It's um, not the best, but it's it's top four, I'd say, for them. It's definitely the best in its category, which so is kind of gritty, kind of grimy, kind of a anti-hero story. It's, I'm only on the first season, but so far it tells the story of a young uh, actor by the name of Jack Quaid, who's Dennis Quaid's son, and mm -hmm. Meg Ryan's son, I believe, uh, who loses someone in his life and is sort of discovered by someone else that has a similar vengeance against the reason that he lost that person, which is these superheroes that are running around this world, and you very quickly learn that they are not what they seem uh, and not what the adoring crowds scream at them for and give them all their love for. There's a much darker side to all of it, and it's really high stakes. It's like got thriller elements, a lot of action. It's pretty gory, so keep that in mind. It's rated R for sure. Yeah, uh, but definitely a lot adult of Adult themes. Yeah, a lot of adult themes, but I think like... I, t I like to see these kinds of stories, especially after being deluged by Marvel for so long and DC, where like everyone is like so cool and you know a just and good citizen to see sort of like the what would really happen in a world where people had absurdly powerful superpowers. Yeah, it's the superhero, but like, how would it exist in our world? Like, they're worried about their branding, and right. they have company sponsorships, and they yeah, the what other they, approval points going up or down in certain regions? What yeah, exactly. Yeah. What demographics are you popular in? What do you have to? How do you have to? You know, brand yourself and blah blah blah. And the superheroes are sort of uh, they're moving around in that world, and yeah, it's it's pretty funny. It's it's irreverent in some ways. Yeah. It's definitely dark and gritty sometimes too um, oh and carl urban finally shows his face in the movie because typically he's like behind the judge dread mask or whatever <laughs> he's uh, really good in it of course great, yeah the the guy that plays homelander which is the superman character that guy makes the whole show for me that guy is like he i don't know he just strikes the perfect tone and it's yeah. the superman in this universe is superman like the most powerful superhero but he's like just like maybe he's completely nuts it's hard to tell yeah, he has this sort of blank look in his eyes sometimes when they cut to him and they show these close-ups that you look at it, and as an actor, I'm watching him and going, wow, he is someplace else. Like, yeah. this person, it feels like he is a different kind of human yeah. entirely when you watch him on screen and how he, he delivers his lines and everything. It's great. And it strikes you as a more realistic portrayal of what a Superman-type character would be like in the real world as far as someone with that much power, how they would be mentally... Yeah. And how they might act and, you know, how does that person navigate the regular world where, like, they're not allowed to do certain things? Like, right. I don't know if the human brain would be equipped to handle that setup where it's like you have the power to do anything and no one can touch you. <laughs> and yet sometimes there's things you're not supposed to do that you want to do. Like how, uh, I don't know, like there's things keeping us all in place, but for a Superman type character, it's super interesting. I love that character the most. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I find the series to be good, not amazing, but uh, it's, it's definitely enjoyable and watchable. Yeah. And bingeable too, which yeah. is kind of the name of the game these yeah, days. Yeah. They just finished season two, so you can watch both seasons on Amazon Prime right now. Yep. Okay. Moving on to the cleanup step where we thank everyone here at the Command Zone office for putting in hard work and diligent hours to be our superheroes. They are our superheroes. Yeah, uh, all right. <laughs> our editing, graphics, and logistics team is Craig Blanchett, Ashlyn Rose, Lady Danger, Manson Lung, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Patrick Nunn, Non, sorry, Alfred Estaca, and Sam Waldo. And big thanks, as always, to Jeffrey Palmer, who does the Living Card animations to start and end our show. This particular one that lives behind us on the set. You can find Jeffrey at Living Cards MTG. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for this episode. Thanks for watching. And we hope you upgrade your deck soon. Peace. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>